Hi, folks. Uh, thank you so much for your time and for being there uh, in person. My name is Alex. I'm a principal solutions architect networking specialist with uh, AWS and strategic accounts. Um, and one of my primary focuses is uh, exactly what, uh, what Veronica mentioned, which is to get customers to adopt IPv6. Uh, and as we are always working backwards from the customers uh, and from their needs, uh, we've identified a couple of approaches to IPv6 adoption um, because we need to speak the language of each um, particular customer. Uh, this is going to be a very, very, very fast-paced uh, presentation. There's a lot of content um, and we only have half an hour. So please, if at the end of it, you folks have questions, you have um, things that you want to talk about related to IPv6, Feel free to ping me on LinkedIn. We can uh, we can set up a call. We can talk about all things IPv6. Uh, I would love that. So coming back to approaches, um, we've identified four main focus areas: uh, the network driven approach, um, which means inside the Amazon VPC, the internal network routing. Um, this is the approach usually driven by the network team. Uh, OS driven approach, and it is um, or OS impacting uh, IPv6 approach. Um, this means making sure that at the OS level, um, all the support is there for IPv6 in terms of library, the libraries, the HTTPv6, DNS resolution, and so on. The third one is code, uh, and this is probably one of the most critical ones because. Uh, Depending on when the code was written, uh, depending on the dependencies of the code, um, IPv4 may be a very, very, very hard coded dependency there. And um, this uh, takes a lot of time uh, to, to get to IPv6 uh, compatibility. And last but not least, and here's where, uh, where AWS is coming uh, into the picture, the, the services layer. Um, the AWS managed services, the customer managed services that you folks can- Recording uh, can in progress. On AWS, and we just started recording. Um, these, uh, these services need to support IPv6, right? Because, okay, we have the code compatible to, to with IPv6, but if the services don't support it, then uh, we're not able to, to do the smooth transition. Given these four main focus areas, um, there are um, two focuses uh, that we are going to talk about today. The network-driven approach, of course, because um, uh, I'm a network person. Uh, a lot of you folks in the in the room probably are are very driven by uh, by networking. Um, and this approach starts with enabling IPv6 inside the VPC, expanding IPv6 um, support in the internal network, and then everything else. Right, um, and it usually starts with the um, with the need um, driven by IPv4 exhaustion. And I'm talking here not IP, uh, public IPv4 exhaustion, but more private IPv4 exhaustion. And at the pace at which networks grow and uh, environments grow, not only on AWS, but in a hybrid world as well, um, IPv4 allocation from RFC 1918 has become uh, pretty scarce. Uh, this means, um, adopting dual stack VPCs and IPv6 only subnets. The ability to deploy IPv6 only subnets gives you that uh, power to scale uh, inside the VPC more than what the IPv4 space would have allowed. Um, and it also means dual, dual stack internal network routing. Uh, why dual stack? Because IPv6 adoption is not a flip of a switch. And there will be a time, a fairly long time, uh, for which the, the network will have to support both IPv4 and IPv6. The second approach is the business-driven approach. And this starts again with the adoption inside of VPC, but it continues with services layer. Why is the service uh, or the, the business-driven approach important? Whenever we're talking to customers, if we're talking to network people and to, to the developer teams, uh, they understand the need for IPv6, right? But the question comes in, well, how do I justify this effort, right? How do I make these resources work for IPv6 adoption? Um, and what's in it for the business, right? And uh, the answer to that is the ability to scale and grow uh, and be ready uh, for IPv6 uh, on the long run. 
this is also driven by the need of having IPv6 enabled endpoints in certain uh, geographies for services. Uh, usually services that uh, make use of customer uh, or client IP addresses to understand client profiles uh, and to uh, sort of do the client stitching across the different devices that the client is using. So because the client can be present on networks where it has IPv6 um, uh, on, on the device, it is important to be able to understand uh, that IPv6 address at the service layer um, of, uh, of that client. Uh, it, it again means uh, enabling dual stack VPCs and dual stack uh, elastic load balancers, as well as uh, the other services that help support exposing uh, public endpoints to the internet like CloudFront or uh, Global Accelerator. Now, the two approaches are there. Where do we start? Well, first things first. Um, in IPv4, uh, we've seen that IP allocation um, has somewhat been driven by um, the, the RFC 1918 private space, reusing it and being able to um, have this overlapping because there was not. Right? In IPv6, things change. And uh, it's important to understand the fact that a good strategy for, for allocating IPv6 addresses um, and making sure that we have those neatly summarizable boundaries and we have the regional allocations uh, is important. Um, the reason for that is because there's so many IPv6 addresses and routing can become extremely complex if we don't manage the way we allocate IPv6 addresses. And we may end up with very, very large route tables if we can't summarize. Uh, for the Amazon VPC, there's two ways to address it uh, for IPv6. You can use uh, AWS assigned uh, ciders. They are randomly assigned from the AWS um, pools regionally. Or you can use bring your own IPv6 addresses. Uh, you can configure them either natively in EC2 or uh, in Amazon VPC IPAM. And this allows you to control uh, your IPv6 addressing on AWS. One very important piece is that the Amazon VPC currently supports global unicast IPv6 addresses. So uh, you are going to be addressing resources in the VPC using GUA. Uh, and we're going to look at how connectivity works uh, to, to make sure that security is also maintained. How does Amazon VPC work with IPv6? We've allocated, right? We've created the strategy. We've created the regional allocation pools. We've created all things. Now, how do we start with it? First, uh, we need to allocate IPv6 addresses to uh, the, the Amazon VPC, creating, therefore, dual stack VPCs. Um, you can create up to, or you can add up to five uh, slash 56 siders to the Amazon VPC and out of these, you can create subnets. You can have dual stack subnets, or you can have IPv6 only subnets in the VPC. A subnet size is fixed to slash 50, uh, 64, and the VPC siders are fixed uh, length uh, slash 56. Now, second, IPv6 routing. It is natively supported by the Amazon VPC. So when you um, allocate the IPv6 siders, the route tables of the VPC get automatically updated with the ciders that you uh, that you add, and routing on IPv6 works. Third is DNS, right? And how is DNS supporting IPv6? Well, the DNS resolver, the VPC cider plus two uh, in IPv4, uh, also has an IPv6 address. And this IPv6 address is used for DNS resolution um, by the workloads running on IPv6 in the VPC. And uh, it supports uh, the, the normal standard DNS resolution supported by Route 53, uh, private DNS in the VPC, uh, VPC DNS, and public DNS resolution. Some of the types. I briefly mentioned that we can have uh, dual stack VPCs with uh, dual stack subnets or IPv6 only subnets. The important thing is that these subnets can coexist in the same VPC. You don't have to recreate your VPC. You don't have to create new VPCs to actually adopt IPv6. 
it is enough to attach the uh, IPv6 cider or ciders to the VPC and then allocate prefixes to subnets. And because we mentioned about the IPv6 only subnets uh, and the fact that they are the ones allowing you to scale beyond the boundaries of, uh, of what IPv4 uh, allowed you in the VPC, here's the IPv6 only subnets. They don't have to have an IPv4 CIDR uh, associated to them and workloads uh, supported in the IPv6 uh, only subnets only have an IPv6 address. IPv6 internet connectivity from the VPC. We have our VPC, which is our network uh, related boundary of workloads on, uh, on AWS. Now we start poking holes into it, right? Uh, we start connecting it. The first uh, connectivity piece is internet connectivity. And here in the Amazon VPC, we have two types of subnets, public subnets and private subnets. The construct coming from IPv4 world, right? Remains the same in IPv6. And the same security posture is enabled on IPv6, uh, irrespective of, uh, of the stack that you're using. For public subnets, uh, internet connectivity, we have the internet gateway, right? So both on IPv4 and on IPv6, we are going to be using uh, the internet gateway for connectivity to the internet and from the internet. Um, public subnets, resources in public subnets uh, that have IPv4 addresses and need to be accessible from the internet on IPv4 uh, need to have elastic IPs associated uh, with them. Elastic IPs are an IPv4 construct, right? The mapping is done at the internet gateway level. And uh, these elastic IPs allow these resources to be exposed in the internet, to be accessible in the internet, again, driven by the configuration of security, right? Security groups, network access control lists, and so on. So even though you expose the resources, um, you still have the security controls to, uh, to make sure you manage appropriately who can connect to those resources. For IPv6 though, the flows are direct. So because IPv6 resources have IPv6 GUA addresses associated with them, uh, they communicate directly to uh, the internet through the internet gateway and uh, internet bound resources can open connections to them. Very, very important, no NAT is happening right at the internet gateway level. So the resources use their own uh, IPv6 addresses to communicate and to be accessed. For IPv6 only subnets, the same applies uh, and uh, the internet gateway is used. And we are going to be looking at how the flow between IPv6 and IPv4 is enabled using, using DNS64 uh, and NAT64. But until we get there, we still have private subnets, right? And in, for private subnets in IPv4, we had the NAT gateway, right? We need to do NAT at scale uh, using the, the NAT gateway, one per AZ in AWS. Um, you can have that, uh, that managed NAT uh, offering and implementation. Absolutely. Still, traffic goes through the NAT gateway, gets NATed, uh, goes to the internet on IPv4. How do things go on IPv6? Well, for a dual stack submit, because it has both IPv4 and IPv6, on IPv4, we keep using the same path, the NAT gateway. On IPv6, though, we have the egress-only internet gateway. Why this construct is extremely important? Um, using NAT is, is and has been seen uh, since forever as being a security construct. Um, the, the mentality of, okay, I have my workloads in a private uh, environment, they don't have uh, internet routable IP uh, addresses. So because they're behind that, they cannot be accessed. That is just a, a one very, very small slice of what security means, right? And yes, correct. It can be seen as a security construct, but it is not enough. right? Security means much more than just putting uh, workloads behind a net. Um, to keep the security posture of private subnets on AWS, these private subnets uh, on IPv6 use egress-only internet gateway. 
What the egress only internet gateway does it is that it allows essentially for the same flow that the NAT gateway allows, which is the egress flow, right? The egress connection to be opened to resources in the internet, but does not allow inbound connections from the internet. Right? So if there's a, uh, a resource in the internet that needs to access a workload on AWS in a private subnet, they won't be able to, right? Even if that CIDR and that IP uh, v6 address is GUA, right? So egress only internet gateway only allows for outbound connections to internet resources. Now, the reason why I mentioned that security or NAT is not uh, the, the security construct or is not the only security construct that we want to rely on is because this workload in our private subnet can open essentially connections to anything in the internet right now, right? If there's no other security mechanism there to filter that traffic. So we need layers of security. Just a summary of what I just said. Egress only internet gateway does not allow internet connections to be open to IPv6 resources in private subnets. For IPv6 only private subnets, the same flow applies. Um, IPv6 only resources can only open connections to IPv6 internet endpoints. And we're gonna get back to IPv6 to IPv4. Now, DNS 6.4, NAT 6.4. Uh, we kept saying uh, about this this flow and the way in which uh, you can achieve this on AWS is by means of DNS resolution. What is DNS 6.4? It is a subnet level setting uh, that allows DNS queries to be intercepted uh, by the DNS resolver. For example, when an IPv6 only EC2 instance has a query for a domain uh, or a DNS name that is IPv4 only. Um, those queries are intercepted and uh, the return or the reply to that query, um, instead of it being an IPv4 address, which is completely useful, useless for an IPv6 only instance uh, or workload, uh, that IPv IPv4 address is padded with the well-known prefix 64 FF90. And because it's padded, uh, it is essentially becoming an IPv6 address that is understood by the IPv6 only EC2 instance. So, uh, or any other workload that lives in that VPC. What means at this point is that when the traffic uh, leaves the IPv6 only EC2 instance, it is going to have an IP destination of 64FF90 um, and the actual real IPv4 address. This traffic cannot leave the VPC, cannot leave uh, the actual environment like that because the destination has no idea what 64FF9B colon colon IPv4 address is. So the traffic needs to go through the NAT64 gateway. The traffic flow for this um, is fairly straightforward. The initial packet coming from the IPv6 only AC2 instance is an IPv6 packet. And when it traverses the NAT uh, gateway, it becomes an IPv4 packet. And you can use NAT64 and DNS64 to communicate with IPv4 only workloads inside the same VPC, in the internet, or in the private network. So no restrictions there. Now, connectivity. We poked the hole with the internet, right? We had internet uh, gateway, egress only internet gateway. Now we need connectivity to the internal network. And uh, the first, uh, first option for connectivity for Amazon VPC is VPC peering. VPC peering natively supports IPv6 addresses. So once you create the peering, uh, you add the routes in the route tables. Those routes can be IPv4 or IPv6 or both. You can also choose not to route IPv4 if you, uh, if you such want to. Um, one note here, the IPv4 addresses have to be known overlapping for uh, the VPC peering to, um, to occur. If we increase the scale, and we're not just talking about two VPCs or about a manageable number of VPCs uh, to create VPC peering, we're looking at uh, constructs like AWS Transit Gateway or uh, AWS Cloud RAM. Both of them natively support IPv6, so 
here we have an example of trans and gateway attachments, uh, two VPCs, they are both enabled for IPv6. The transit gateway attachment subnets have to be dual stack so that the transit gateway knows uh, how to route IPv6 as well as IPv4. And routes in the route tables are configured as, um, as regular pointing to the transit gateway. On the transit gateway, route tables are populated with VPC ciders. So uh, both IPv4 and IPv6 are supported. Very important here, um, Consider summarization. It is one of the most important pieces when we're talking about that routing at scale, right? Um, because in IPv6, there's no semi-summary routes of RFC 1918, right? Uh, we cannot just put in the route table 10 slash 8, 172, 16 slash 12. Um, we need to route some ciders. And because IPv6 is GUA in the VPC, um, and you need to have four VPCs that have internet connectivity on AWS, the default route to the internet gateway or the egress on the internet gateway. There's no more routes that you can put to express those summaries unless you have rightly configured uh, the CIDR block uh, allocation to be summarizable. Now, hybrid connectivity. We have VPC connectivity on AWS. We need to connect hybridly to uh, our on-premises locations. For this, we have AWS Direct Connect, dedicated uh, connectivity for, uh, for on-prem locations. You have multiple ways of creating Direct Connect connections um, and associating them with resources on AWS. Uh, you have direct uh, VGW association with VPC you can have Direct Connect centralized through the transit gateway, and you can have public virtual uh, interfaces that allow you to access AWS services directly. All of these support IPv6. So uh, on each of the uh, virtual interfaces, you will have a BGP session for IPv4, a BGP session for the IPv6 address family, natively supporting the routing of, uh, of IPv4 and IPv6. Site-to-site -site VPN, again, it is uh, natively supported for transit gateway integration, and you will need to have a VPN uh, for IPv4 and a VPN connection for IPv6. Very uh, straightforward. Now, we've talked about the routing and the connectivity piece. Uh, what about application exposure? Uh, for that on AWS, you can use uh, elastic load balancers to, uh, to manage that uh, exposure of um, endpoints at scale. Um, the two uh, fundamental load balancers on AWS that help you with that, the application and network load balancers, support dual stack listeners with IPv4 only or IPv6 only targets. So you can choose to have end-to-end -end routing. How does that look? Well, dual stack ALB with IPv6 targets. The ALB subnets need to have need to be dual stack because the listeners are dual stack. So you are going to have an IPv4 address and an IPv6 address associated with your listener. And the targets can be IPv6 only. So here we're coming back to the ability of using IPv6 only subnets to scale your environment. You can integrate those IPv6 only subnets in the workloads you deploy there with ALBs or NLBs, and you can have end to end IPv6 flows. For a network load balancer, again, the same thing the network load balancer subnet needs to be dual stack, and the targets uh, can be IPv6 only. Private link, an extremely loved service. Um, supports IPv6 natively for custom managed services. So your services that you expose uh, using NLBs and endpoint services uh, natively support uh, supports IPv6. So depending on how your service is deployed, you can choose to have your V4 only service exposed to VPC um, clients that are V6 enabled, or you can migrate your VP, uh, your service to IPv6 without impacting at all the end uh, client or the consumer VPC that continues to use IPv4 for uh, access. 
Uh, one important thing for the uh, VPC endpoint ANIs, extremely, extremely important. They still have GOA IPv6 addresses, right? So essentially they're still routed. Uh, to make sure that we keep the security posture of these interfaces, uh, there is a flag associated to them, which says deny all IGW traffic. It is enabled by default and it cannot be disabled, which means that those VPC endpoints, exactly as you have them in IPv4, they are uh, in IPv6 as well. Uh, they cannot be accessed from the internet. They can only be accessed from the VPC or a peer VPC on IPv6. Now, we've talked a lot about networking. Uh, our last pit stop is all the other AWS services that support IPv6. Here are just a few of them. This year, we've had 20 plus launches of services and features that support IPv6. And we are working backwards from what our customers need. Um, so uh, having said that, uh, and looking at this uh, this neat slide here with um, with some of the the features that we support, um, our call to action and my call to action to you is to let us know, talk to us, uh, talk to your account team, talk to your SAs, ping me, um, let us know what services you need and what is your priority for IPv6 adoption. We want to make sure that we uh, we have those on. Um, uh, on our radar and we work backwards from them. That being said, um, we are two minutes early, so we have uh, probably uh, two minutes for questions if you folks have any. If not, please feel free to to ping me, um, to ping Veronica and, um, and have us connected. Okay. Thank you very much, Alexandra. I'm just getting a catch box, uh, which we are using here. Um, as a as the mobile microphone, but thank you. This was really excellent talk. Really appreciate it. Um, yeah, I've got quite a few hands. So I'm just going to start here from the middle. Radek. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you. Oh, good morning to the United States. Thank you very much for the presentation. Really great uh, summary. I have one uh, question. If we could make the IPv6 uh, capabilities of VPCs on by default because currently the customers have to opt in. Uh, it, it works great, but the customers have to opt in and developers often don't have the right set of experience to do so, to go there and click it or configure it. Thank you. Great feedback. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm not able to talk about what we have on our roadmap and what are the things to come, but thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Hi, Alexandra, this is Tom Hill from BT. Um, Hi. I have been dreaming about this talk from AWS for years. Um, I'm really, really glad and grateful to see it. I've been enthusing anyone I know who's worked at AWS, which at some point was the head of EC2, um, about this, and they were all sick of hearing from me. But thankfully, someone's been working on it, and it's it's actually happening. So I'm really grateful to, to see this today. So fantastic. My, my original question was mainly about how are you going to enthuse your customers to utilize this? How are you going to pitch this? Is it going to be sold as better than? But I believe you've already answered that and you can't tell us yet. But I'm hoping, I'm <laughs> hoping that this is quite a seismic change uh, for the deployment of IPv6 across the internet and the prevalence of it in the minds of people who are not just network nerds like us. So thank you yeah. again, appreciate it. Great. Thank Thanks, you. Tom. I think the more the more we talk about it, the more we publish things about it, which is our strategy essentially. I think I published like four blogs in the last year about IPv6 support and services on AWS. Um, this comes to complement the actual need, which may be there for a lot of customers. For sure, there are a lot of customers who are dealing with IPv4 exhaustion, right? But again, uh, there are also a lot of them who say, well, wait, what? We have like 4 billion IP addresses. I'm not dealing with any IPv4 exhaustion, um, private IPv4 exhaustion. So I think there's, there's different ways of talking to customers. And I think we are doing uh, more in speaking the language of each type of customer. Excellent. Well, really quick one, because we are already overdue, and I know Alexandra has got a customer engagement. Sure. Uh, it, was, it was more about, have you benchmarked it, and is it any faster? 
Oh, that is the question. That is the question. Um, that there's so much debate around it. And I think it's, it depends so much on what you're actually using. If I were to benchmark it on, uh, I don't know, uh, P4DN EC2 instance and using some specific network conditions, it may end up being faster. If I use, I don't know, five internet carriers in the internet to actually access an IPv6 endpoint, it may actually be very much slower because of the IPv6 failure rate. So it depends. The, the question to that is, is it depends. Uh, we are working on doing more on that and on getting more metrics out there. So stay tuned. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you so much, Alexandra. Really appreciate yeah. you joining us so early in the morning. And uh, thank you guys for the questions. Good luck with your customer meeting. Okay, Thank see you, so you next much. time. Have a, have a